Okay. So today is Monday, October 28th, 2013, and I'm Linda Conley at my home here on Pleasant Street in Hopkinton, and I'm talking to Jeff Berber, for also from Hopkinton. Uh, this interview will be part of the oral history project here in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Uh, it's funded by the, Hop the Community Preservation Committee, and this story, this interview, will be part of a collection of um, many other interviews where we hope to share these oral histories um, with people in the present and into the future. So, Jeff, if you'd introduce yourself and you know, tell us your okay. name and how long you've lived here. Uh, my name is Jeff Ferber, and I currently live in uh, Woodville, uh, but I used to live in, on Elm Street, and my parents moved to Elm Street in 1952 because uh, there was too much traffic in Natick and they wanted a farm and they wanted a, a, to have some open space around and so they moved we moved to Elm Street and which is our farm was just up the street from what is now the Elmwood School on the same side of the road and uh, we had 12 acres Wow. Okay, so that, you're talking about farm. where the uh, condominium complex is now? Is that about uh, where you The next about? farm over. Okay. The condominium, where the condominiums are now, belong to a family by the name of, when I grew up there, by the name of Stone. And one of the girls, who was my neighbor, uh, now lives right on West Main Street. And the previous people who owned the farm, their name was Creedon, and they had about 40 acres down there, which includes where the, um, the condos are now. Right, and what are those condos called now, so we people can, uh, can know? Apple Hill, Apple Tree, something. <laughs> okay. And um, the family by the name of Creedon lived there, and they had a big, huge barn with mm -hmm. a... Um, basketball court inside, mm -hmm. big huge wooden beams, and below the um, barn was uh, between 25 and 40 stanchions for cows that they had. Okay, so this is not, I, I'm, I'm just a little, is this, this is the same property that your, that your parents no, bought? This no, this is our next door neighbor, next door neighbor. to okay. the north of us. Yeah. We lived uh, one farm to the south of them, and the land that we owned, we had 10 acres on the left-hand side going up Elm Street, mm -hmm. which is still there, but it's all grown up. It used to be cleared fields. Yeah. But it's all grown up now, and there's huge trees, and of course, that's, it's been since 66 since we moved out. And we had two or th three acres uh, that went on the house side, and then the f next farm up the street from us was uh, Doyle's farm, and they had, I think Mr. Doyle had 40 acres anyways that went beyond the um, pipeline, wow. which was right, the gas line that was wow. right behind our house. Wow. Yeah. What, what kind of farms? You know, elaborate a little um, bit. He had, Mr. Doyle had yeah. a, um, uh, a couple of cows. And at one point, he had uh, a bull that he used to keep with the cows, and he had them all in a, um, uh, a section of the field down back near the pipeline that was surrounded by uh, wire and, and um, uh, stone walls. And we would sneak in and mess around with the cows, and, and the bull would often come out of the... The, the section they were in had some trees in it, and so the bull was always wandering around in the trees, and we would sneak in, and I mean, we were like seven and eight and nine years old, and we'd sneak into that field and go... So what year are you talking house. about when you were doing this? You know, what year were you sneaking in where the bull oh, was? Oh, um, 56 and 57, because I was, I was born in 46, so we moved here in 51 or 2. So I was only six or seven, and uh, uh, 
Mr. Doyle was always our neighbor. And of course, we'd go up there and we'd play in the, in the barn. Uh, his son came down to hay our 10-acre field because he, they needed the, the hay to, for the cows and things. And he would come down and he cut the field with a horse-drawn mower. Wow. And <laughs> my job, as I got older, when he would come down and do the field, was to, when he would stop to get a drink of water or something, in the summertime, I would um, have the oil can and go into the, the, they had little, these little spots on the mower that mm -hmm. needed to be oiled, mm -hmm. you know, like once or twice a day. So I'd go up and I'd oil all the spots and then he'd continue. And then he'd come back later on after the hay was dry and we'd pitch it into a hay wagon, which was drawn by the horse, and um, then he'd take it back up to the barn. And he had chickens, he had um, foxes, and he had the cows. A few you cows. You mean domestic fo or foxes for? Well, for I'm not sure pelts? what they did with the foxes. Yeah. I just knew that they had they had these uh, big pens, and he had four of them. Yeah. I have no idea what they ever did with them. I, you never saw them because they were always inside the the, the cages, yeah. in inside yeah. their little house. Yeah. And uh, so that was... Uh, so your parents came from Natick looking for a more rural lifestyle? That's correct. And they, want, they chose yep. to, to, to work on, have a farm? And, yep. And that's and my how father, your dad made his living? My father, no, my father worked for Reliable Cleaners in Natick. My mother worked for Paul Phipps Insurance here, uptown for a while. And um, my father had chickens, and we probably had a hundred chickens out in the backyard. And it was my job and my older sister's job to take care of the chickens if my father couldn't get home from work in time. So just just free we roaming, had, or you had them in a in a in no? A some of, some of them were free run. Yeah. And uh, some of them, um, the others were in cages, so you had to go out in the winter time and bring hot water and to knock the ice out of the the dishes and put water in them and feed them and like I said he probably had 30 or 40 coops and we also had another wow. chicken coop that had uh, Rhode Island Reds for laying eggs and it was uh, my job to go out and get the uh, the eggs out of the thing every day. And my father would sell the eggs to people that he knew in Natick that were on his delivery route once in a while. Wow, so this is 50s and 60s? This is uh, 50s and uh, very early 60s. And when I was, uh, I first went to school, we moved here, I went to center school and my first teacher was um, uh, Mrs. Catherine Smith, mm -hmm. who was the wife of one of the owners of Brown and Smith's. Um, John Smith was the brother of the owner, Bill, and John worked at the store. So tell so Brown and Smith, tell us about that. It was um, Brown and Smith was a um, a lunch counter, a breakfast spot, and it was sort of like um, the hub of Hopkin and right across the street from the library where Bill's Pizza is now. And they sold magazines, they sold canned goods, they sold papers, um, and you could just about get anything there. <laughs> and they always had, the their regular townies would always be there in the morning for breakfast. I mean, you could count on it, you knew exactly who was sitting where, and. And of course they had people stopping in to get coffee to go as though there wasn't any other place in town at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, I went to the center school and I can remember going to the, what is now uh, One Ash Street. Mm -hmm. There was a gymnasium there. And we used to trek from the center school in the wintertime mm -hmm. to the gymnasium which had no heat. <laughs> and we would play basketball or run or whatever our gym teacher wanted us to do 
And then we'd go back to the, the school. And uh, we, at times, when you couldn't get to the, if there was a lot of snow and they didn't have paths shoveled out, we would have gym class indoors, right in the area before you go into the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. They would bring the, the, uh, the mats in and we'd uh, tumble and exercise. And after, and we'd have it right before our um, lunch hour. So by the time the, all us little kids were done jumping around, it was pretty sweaty and smelly in there. And you could tell that there was a gym class had been in there. And that was grades? Um, uh, one through, one through six. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And when I was in seventh grade, we moved to um, the high school, of the, what is now the middle school, and they had just put a wing on, and it was for seventh and eighth grade uh, kids. And but we never, uh, we were sort of intimidated because of the high school being right next door, right mm -hmm. down the hallway, and we really never went much further than the library. So about what year was that then? Uh, you in seventh grade? Um, let's see. That would have been 58 or 59. And when I was at, when we were at the center school, being a, a sixth grader, I had a teacher by the name of Mr. Dell. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Dell would send me to Brown and Smith's to pick up coffee and English muffins <laughs> for the teachers. Oh. <laughs> so <clears throat> 10 o'clock or 9.30, he'd send me over there with some money and I'd give them the order, and then I'd come back, and I'd have to take them to the teacher's room. And, of course, the teachers were all smoking in there. And you open the door, and it was just like going into a fog <laughs> bank. <bag. laughs> I remember teachers smoking, too. Yeah. And we had, um, uh, back then, the teachers uh, did not, um, were not like the teachers of today. And if you were bad or didn't do something they liked, you went to the principal's office and he smacked your knuckles with a ruler. So that was a pretty Did you ever have that happen? Did you ever get your um, knuckles No, I, I <laughs> got sent to the principal's office a couple of times, but the principal, he was a, uh, everyone really didn't like him. His, his name was Mr. Thibodeau, and he was scary, and he scared the heck out of me, that's for sure. Um, and they threatened to, you know, yeah. whack you over the knuckles. Yeah. But there were some kids who did, who, who got that, but I had never done anything to, to uh, warrant that, I guess. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you can keep with the school. What about high school? You know, you have recollections of, of, of being um, in high school and what that was like? Or? High school was... Um, I have to say that I, we only had 40 kids in class, in my class. I think there was 40 or 41. And all the high school, of course the principal, Mr. Carey, mm -hmm. and the superintendent, Jack O'Brien, they were all townies, of course. And uh, they knew all the kids by f their first names. It's, you know, and they may do that today, but there's so many kids in school. That, yeah, un unlikely. They yeah. know your face now, but and, they wouldn't know everybody's name. And they would, um, you just knew all these people. Uh, the teachers knew everybody by their first names. And, and uh, we all knew the teachers because they all lived in town for the most part. A yeah. lot of them did. Yeah. 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 So probably two classes. I mean, prior to high school, there would have been two classes of your grade. Right? You know, two... Um, yes, there was. Um, I started out with Mrs. Smith, and then there was another class, and I really don't remember what her, uh, her name was, but uh, mostly women yeah. teachers, of course, yeah. in those days. Um, let's see. Um... After we, after we got out of, as we got older, um, 
um, some of the kids would, would ride their bicycles to school, some of the rest of us took a bus, and you got to know the, the school bus drivers because they were mm -hmm. just like your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a, when I was um, 13 or 14, I bought a car from Irvine's Garage, which is across the street mm -hmm. from the school, mm -hmm. for $27.50. And they delivered it to my house because I was only 14 or so. And I used that car in the field across the street. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a racetrack out there. And the neighborhood people would come from uh, all up and down the street to ride in my car. And when it got muddy and rainy, of course, it was wonderful because you could spin the car. So you can drive a car under 16 without a license. I mean, maybe you still can. In a field. I don't know. In a field, on your in a own field. property. On your yeah. own property, yes. So and you were 13 driving a car? Yep. Yeah. And that's where I learned how to drive, basically. And when I took driver's ed in um, high school, Mr. Moriarty was my driver ed teacher. And I always had to sit in the back and observe because he knew darn well that I, that I was driving and had driven a lot. And so he said, I asked him one day, I said, how come I don't get to drive? And he says, you drive on the way home. He said, I know you've been driving. He says, I know you know how to drive a car. And my father, when I was 14, on Sunday mornings we would drive to Upton to pick up a, uh, a friend of my father's uh, who was blind. He was a cobbler, and he did not live in the best conditions, so we'd bring him down to the house for Sunday dinner to make sure he got a real good meal, and he would come down every other Sunday, and my father would let me drive to Upton, along with him in the car, of course, to... Um, without a license. Without a license. <laughs> um, but in those days... There were, there were never hardly any police around. I mean, the roads were very narrow. West Main Street was, was just a two-lane road. And you never saw hardly any cars. And so I would drive up, and then I would pick him up, and I would drive back. And my father would coach me if I was not doing the right thing while I was driving. So I, I, had, I was well versed in driving by the time I got to go for my license. And the license was, a, you had to You've learn the rules. You've been driving for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, um, when we were on the farm, my, when I was probably 13 or 14, I used to pedal my bike down to... Lake Maspinock to fish. Mm -hmm. And we had a hawk that was in the backyard killing my father's chickens. And when there's a hawk in the backyard, the chicken yard is quiet as a mouse. You don't hear a word. Otherwise, the chickens are clucking and they're flying around and doing whatever. So they, they, know. Do. they know. They know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my mother came down once and she said, The hawk is in the backyard. She drove down, we had a Volkswagen bus, one of those combi buses, horrible. <laughs> and she, she drove down, I left my bike down there at the pond, she drove me back, and I went in and got my father's 22, which he didn't know how to operate, but it was, I did all the shooting in the family anyways. And I was out looking for the hawk. Now I found out later that the hawk sat in the trees, didn't circle above like those hawks don't go after chickens. He sat in the tree and, and of course it blended in with the tree and the leaves and everything. So he was probably sitting right on the trees around our property and along the stone wall all the time and I just never could see him. So I walked around the yard and I'm looking for the, the hawk and I'm going around behind all the coops and stuff and I came around back in, and part of the, 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 field, the coops in the yard were in an area that was open mm -hmm. because we mowed it all the time. Part of the rest part of the field was uh, tall grasses and bushes and 
the chickens used to lay their eggs under the trees and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I walked around the back of a coop and there was the hawk sitting on one of my father's chickens. Uh -huh. And he was picking the feathers away from the neck. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. And he was, so I just named the gun at him. And my mother is screaming at me, don't shoot your father's chickens. And so I shot the hawk, of course, and killed it. And I waited for a few minutes to see if it was still alive. And of course it wasn't. And I picked it up by its talons and held it up so that my mother could see it. Wow, wow. <laughs> And we, we eventually, we put it, I put it in the, um, the barn, in a, in a cage in the barn that my father used to keep the chickens in, and so that when he got home he could take a look at it. And we had the talons cut off and mounted on a board, and I think I called a, the animal people or somebody to find out what kind of hawk it was. And they said I shouldn't have shot it, that it was endangered and all that. Probably a red tail hawk? No. No, not no, a red tail? It was a, um, it was a gosh hawk. Oh, wow. Yeah. The red wow. tails are the yeah. kind that circle. Yeah. Um, gosh hawks and sharp shinned hawks are the kind that That's sit what in I trees. have. I have back here a yeah. sharp shinned. And they yeah. come in, in the wintertime, they pick off birds from my bird feed. That's and exactly I've seen correct. Them. And they, have in that. the snow, they pin them down and they, yeah. and they pluck. And you're right. Everything's quiet out there. All the other birds, complete, they're completely gone and they're completely silent. Yeah. And, yeah. and I used to, um, since we had chores of, of uh, taking care of the chickens, my sister would do it one day and I'd do it the next. And if I wanted to play hockey over at the ice house, as it got dark, like 4, 4.30, quarter to 5. Which, I, I, which ice house? Ice house pond. Okay, right. On West Main Street. Right. Um, which was right across the field. You'd go over through our 10 acres, across the blueberry patch, climb the hill, and you were there. Um, my sister would water the chickens, and then I'd have to do the dishes for her at night, because we had, as kids, we had to, um, she and I both had to do chores and do dishes after supper and, and take care of the chickens. So. That was always, we would always be swapping off various things if she didn't want to do something or uh, do the dishes, then, then I'd take care of them. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds really good. Yep. And we also, as, as, as kids, we made trails in the woods. I could, uh, I had permission to go on any of the land of my neighbors. And eventually that went into the... Um, gas line, the pipeline down there, and everybody, all the kids used that as a, as a way to get somewhere else. So we all made trails through the woods, clearing brush and trees, to get to our friend's house, and some of them went up as far as um, almost up the top of Bear Hill. We had some trails made because I had a few, a uh, couple of uh, guys in my class that, and you'd always make a trail to their house. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, and we used to ride our, uh, as we got a little bit older, we used to ride our bicycles all over the place, of course, uptown. Um, and we'd ride to uh, Woodville a lot, to Lake Whitehall to fish or swim. And we'd stop at the uh, a place called Wheeler's Store. Mm -hmm. which was built into his house. It's right across the street from the Woodville Post Office. And uh, Mr. Wheeler was a big, huge guy. And uh, we'd go in there. I mean, riding from Elm Street to Woodville, it's only two miles. But in the summer, being only 10 and 12 and 13 years old, it seemed like a real long way. And it's a hill. Going back yeah. up, that's a hill. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we'd get, get down there and you'd be, we'd be tired and thirsty, so we'd go into Wheeler's and get a bottle of Coke or something and, and, uh, and then go down swimming or fishing and then pedal back. So they did, there was swimming, at, I mean, did you swim, was legal and it was okay to swim in Lake Whitehall? They allowed um, that or you just... Well, no, it probably wasn't legal, but yeah. everybody seemed to do it and yeah. at that time, 
No one really said There was nobody said there to tell you you no. couldn't do it. No, know? it wasn't like it, it was a state park. At, I mean, I'm sure it was a state park at the time. Yeah. But as kids... Yeah, there was no attendant there. No, there was nobody no, there. no. Yeah. And, uh, oh, let's see. We also used to go, as we got older, there used to be a place called uh, Haywood's Dairy. And that was down... Haywood? Haywood. Yeah. Yeah, H-E-Y-W-A-R-D. And that was right across from the uh, boat ramp at Whitehall. And there's four houses there now. Mm -hmm. But at one point, it was just Haywood's Dairy and a big parking lot. And we used to, um, it was one of our, as we got older, we'd, we'd either drive down or ride down with somebody who had a license. And eventually, after I got my license, we'd, we'd drive down there. And it was a, sort of like our first uh, get-together meeting with people from out of town, kids, mm -hmm. because they would all drive over and they were all just had their licenses. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like a, it wasn't like a, a, a online dating or anything, but <laughs> you just met these people because they lived in Westboro, and, and normally you wouldn't get to meet kids in Westboro or from Westboro or Upton unless you met it an ice cream place like that. And at one point, we used to take the the, um, the kids up to what they call the ghost town. And Nobody has talked about the ghost town. Well, yeah, you got to mention that. And we would, the ghost town was was on Pond Street. And there, there was a big, huge field and a couple of old houses right next to the cemetery. And in order to get in there, you're talking about Bear Hill Cemetery? What yes. Cemetery? Yeah, okay. Bear Hill Cemetery. Yep. Um, we used to walk in. Of course, you'd go in the dark. You wouldn't go in during the daylight hours because the guy who owned the field evidently didn't want you out there. and You were theoretically on his property, I guess. And we used to take kids up there. We used to, when we'd go to Haywards, we'd say, Oh, have you ever seen the ghost town? And they would say, No. <laughs> I say, well, follow us. And so we would get in a car and we'd drive up there and we'd have them park first and then we'd park last and we'd take them up into the, through the graveyard and into this old house that was up there. And it had a trap door in the um, porch where you really? go down inside. And of course it's all dark and there's bats and there's all sorts of things in the house, and there were shingles all over the place from disrepair. So we'd lead the kids in the house, and then we'd duck out the window and hide in under the <laughs> trap door, and they'd be wandering all around the house, and we had uh, other kids that would come with us, they would be throwing things at the house and making noises like a, like a real ghost house. And then we'd take off and leave them there. <laughs> and that's why we parked last so right. that we could be right. out first right. and uh, it was all in good fun <coughs> and no one ever got hurt or no one ever got in any trouble um, sometimes we'd hang around to help the kids get out of there I had, I've heard mention of ghost town but yep. yeah, yeah so just an abandoned house then huh? yes it yeah. was just a, well there was I guess there was another section that they would call the ghost house that uh, Mike Shepard once uh, was telling me about. But we never saw that part, and I'm not sure if it's why, but this house was uh, just up near the lake. I mean, you could get to, you could access the lake mm -hmm. from this house. Mm -hmm. So if you came up by boat or canoe, you could walk up in there. Wow. And uh, it was a. Uh, Sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, it really sounds it fun. It was interesting. And uh, I used to, uh, all of us kids had, of course, had, we, none of the kids were, were, my friends were well off. So we were always looking for part-time jobs and things. Ooh. And I had a part-time job when I was uh, probably 14, and I had to ride up to his this guy's house on Lumber Street in um, 
it was he had a nursery up there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was the fellow's name was Joe Shepherd, and I think he was a um, a World War One veteran, I believe, wow. and he had um, he had been gassed during the war and had like one lung was completely missing, and he had this nursery that he would sell things, uh, plants. And he had he wanted local kids to mow the lawns, pick weeds. Is it at the end of is it lumber and granite? Was it right no, in that corner? No. Um, okay. It was right up where if you turn on to lumber from West Main, mm -hmm. there's an automotive place. Yeah. And McIntyre's place where they have all the big machines. Mm -hmm. It was right there. And um Actually, it's it's just beyond that where New View's Stone and Gardens is. Mm -hmm. The how one of the houses still there. Joe's house and his garage are gone. Um, I remember that Joe had two foreign cars, a Volkswagen, and some Renault of some kind, and they were funny little cars at the time. <laughs> when everybody had these big, huge things, and um, and Joe's wife Thea had a uh, Mercedes of some kind, and I remember that he would part of our chores, amongst pulling weeds and mowing lawns and fertilizing and trying to keep the place looking nice. Uh, we'd help her bring in the uh, groceries from. When she, she, Joe had a, um, since he was a veteran, mm -hmm. he had uh, permission to buy his food and liquor from the military base in Boston. So she would drive in, or they would drive in, and Joe had trouble getting around. He had trouble walking, he had trouble breathing. And Joe had a, a small pond out behind his house. He had a very nice house, by the way, mm -hmm. and a nice barn. And this pond that was out behind his house had his ducks. His ducks were his favorite. But in the pond was a big snapping turtle. And the snapping turtle would always try and eat the ducks. They do. Yeah. And we'd be out there working in the, in the field pulling weeds. And Joe would ring the bell at the door. And we'd come running. And he'd say, the snapping turtle is chasing my ducks, so we'd get, he, Joe had this oh, plywood boat that leaked like a sieve, <laughs> and we'd be bailing, and the other kid would be paddling, and we'd be out there trying to chase around the, the snapping turtle or, or chase the ducks up onto the shoreline. And, and it was pretty interesting, and I think I worked there maybe um, two summers until it got, the last summer that I worked there, it was really hot, and it was horrible being out there in the field, weeding yeah, and yeah, raking. Yeah. And I decided that I would try and do something else, but a lot of the kids in our, my class had lived uptown here, mm -hmm. and they had um, paper routes. And when kids in the, uh, 60s had a paper route in town, they made a lot of money because they all got good tips from there and Christmas bonuses from there. Yeah, good job for a kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, in 60, let's see, I graduated in 64. In 65, we had a blackout here and it took out a lot of the Northeast. So I remember black. that blackout. Yeah. Yep. And in December of sixty, December of sixty-five, uh, somebody came to our door. I had been drafted and was supposed to go in the military mm -hmm. uh, during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And a guy came by and said to my parents, came by and said, "We've taken some pictures of your land by plane." And you could see all of my father's chicken coops and my racetrack mm -hmm. and my car. And uh, they said, we'd like to 
we're, we're making a alternative power line system for to alleviate a blackout problem and we'd like to buy your land and your farm and my father told the guy he said my son's going in the army and January 5th. He says, you can buy here on the 6th and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. And they did. And uh, they sold the farm and they were out of here in uh, June of 66. Wow. And wow. they left because the town was getting too crowded. And because we moved here, there was maybe three or 4,000 people. And by '66, in, in '50, and what year? What year did they move here? '52. Yeah. Yeah. And they left in '66. And they left in '66, and of course it got more traffic. 495 was being mm -hmm. put in up the street a ways. I think they'd got down as far as Marlboro because when I left for the service, 495 had not gotten down as far as Hopkinton. And when I came home on leave in 67 or 68, it was already there. And my parents, of course, had been long gone. But um, they moved again. They, they moved because it was too crowded here. I'd heard that somebody uh, that went to Vietnam, another guy told me that, I asked him what was different about coming back. And he said, yeah, 495 was there. Yeah. It didn't look the same. No, yeah, it didn't. And then in 495, cut right across the trails that I had and my friends had. We had all put in there. Yeah. And um, it took down a fairly good sized farm that was right up there, right by the interchange, and a couple of other houses. So. Yeah, see, I can't envision that. You know, I can't envision what it would be like. I'm picturing different parts of the town, but that, without 495, I just can't, no. can't go there in my head. Ah. <sighs> Well, I think that's okay. about it, I okay. think. Um, no, it was terrific. It was um, terrific. It was great to talk to you. So you did, you went You went to Vietnam then, huh? No. I, no, you didn't. No, I got lucky. They, um, I, I was drafted in 65, and I had a girlfriend at the time and didn't want to be gone for Christmas. They were supposed to, I was supposed to... Um, leave for uh, my um, uh, for Fort Dix on the 22nd of December and of course that's right before Christmas and I didn't want to do that so they said I could have uh, another week or two as long as I signed up for an extra year really yep and which uh, that's what I did I enlisted instead of being drafted mm -hmm. and you have to spend three years so I gave up an extra year in the service for ten days at home, which. Well, you get to also if you if you enlist, you have a little more choice as to what, what goes um, on, right? Somewhat. Yeah. But um, they were still taking a lot of the enlisted fellows. Um, got sent to Vietnam, just depending on what they needed at the time, yeah. because eventually. Um, when I went in. When I was due to, uh, I, sent, I spent um, eight to ten weeks down in Fort Dix in the middle of winter, which wasn't fun. And then I went to Aberdeen Proving Grounds for six weeks, which was wonderful. By then it was springtime. And then they shipped me to Germany. And all of us guys, of course, when we, when we graduated from basic training, we all looked at our orders mm -hmm. to see what the zip code was. And if you had an 09 in your zip code, that meant you were going to Vietnam. Because right. everything over that way was 09 something. And then if you were going to Europe, it was a completely different um, zip code or army zip code. You know, from your class of 64, did you, were there a, any, anybody else in the service? You know, how many uh, people yeah. were drafted? Yeah, yeah there was a, a fellow by the name of Eddie Rackett. He went to Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, he was on one of those um, uh, 
boats that went up the river, patrol boats. Um, there were a lot of Hopkins guys over in Europe, and, but back then the only way that you could ever know that somebody was there, there was no email, of course, right, and there was no way of contacting anybody right. other than if you wrote a letter home. Right, who else went? Who else is there? And then yeah. you found out through whatever that uh, that they were over there. Yeah, but you know, I found out my two of my neighbors from Elm Street were uh, over there, and a boy from South Street, I mm -hmm. went to see him while he was there. He was. Uh, we both ended up in Germany. And a lot of times when people from Vietnam are rotated back to the uh, U.S., uh, they spend a year in Germany or two yeah, before yeah. they get go back. Yeah. And I spent um, three years in Germany. But, uh, All right. So well, I didn't have to go. Thank you very much for talking with me, Jeff. You're welcome. So this concludes the uh, Hopkinton um, oral history interview today. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. I learned a lot of new things. <laughs> All right. Take care.